So far with these non-game controversy focused videos, I have been looking at games from me youth that were formative in building up my love for the medium. Whether they be a bunch of mediocre PC titles from the mid-90s to the early 00s, or just one particular title that's still one of my favorite experiences in games and opened up the path towards several other favorites of mine. Now, while I would like to say that the goal for these projects are to create an exercise in examining my own childhood nostalgia, they're mostly built on the idea of... Oh, that'd be fun to do. Oh, that'd be fun to do. I'm gonna make Galaxy so it has some proto-Galaxy uh, elements. Oh, that's fucking dumb! I just got hit out of a cutscene. Oh, that'd be fun to do. <laughs> that said, through these projects, I have been noticing some peculiar aspects with the effects of nostalgia and the attachment one gets to certain forms of media. Really, any form of media. Allow me to blow y'all's minds with this psychological truth bomb. If something you watch, play, listen to, etc, etc, makes a big enough impression, or has some stimuli attached to it, memories surrounding those experiences will be formed and permanently imprinted on the mind. Even if it eventually falls off of long-term memory. This is why there have been so many folks in the comments of those childhood PC gaming videos attempting to search for old games they play during their respective childhoods. They remember certain aspects, but they don't quite remember what the thing is. However, as was evident with some of the trash I went through in the making of those vids, not all memories hold up to scrutiny. Outside of that particular niche though, there's one game I played back then that easily fits this bill. It's a game that I am incredibly fond of, yet to practically anyone else will look like the most generic piece of trash ever. But it stuck with me for all these years though, while also being one of the games I played that I'd never actually put a lot of time into. So I decided to take this opportunity to see how well it has aged after all this time and see if I can prove to y'all that regardless of what game it is, anything you play during your youth can make an impact on your big brain. Welcome to my review of the 1995 Super Nintendo Entertainment System classic, Frank Thomas's Big Hurt Baseball. I believe I mentioned during those childhood PC gaming videos that the Super Nintendo was my first gaming console, and there were several games for it I played alongside this particular game that would probably be a thousand times more interesting to talk about and examine down to the tiniest sprite, but now instead we're just going to look at a dumb baseball game. Make no mistake though, this thing really does take up a good chunk of the fondest memories I have with the SNES, and I've rediscovered it a fair few times in the years since. As I said though, I wanted to give this curious product a good scrubbing to see if there was anything to it beyond the large veil of nostalgia I had covered it with for so long. I also wanted to be as authentic as I was in those videos, so with this idea in mind, I confidently strode right over to my laptop. Then I downloaded a ROM of the game and loaded up in Bizhawk. Uh, forgive me for going down the scallywagging route again, but I wasn't particularly interested in bringing up my old-ass Super Nintendo to record 480p max footage, nor did I want to get one of those aftermarket things with HDMI output and junk. Not for a lack of funds, per se. More so a suspicious feeling I had about it derived from some of those memories. Fuck it. Hold up. Then again, considering it's a supremely irrelevant baseball game from the mid-90s, I don't think anyone will be too upset about how inauthentic this childhood revisit will be. Or maybe they will. Who knows? I can't predict jack shit in the YouTube world. So let me try to recreate those brief experiences of re-encountering this game and the feelings that arise from it. Starting it up, we get the standard copyright info, which stays there for a good while, and was something I always found kind of annoying. Then it gives way to more copyright info. Okay, yeah, I, I know, this is a very riveting start. After that crap goes away, we're treated to the Mr. Big Hurt himself in all his mo-capped glory, slapping a baseball right into our dopey faces. Ouch. I guess it's not majorly impressive so far, but... Oh, 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 oh wait a minute, what's that? 
Is that is that a bop? Oh, I think that's a bop. Oh yeah, this is a bop. As funny as it is seeing Mr. Big Hurt pulling a literal fourth wall break, this theme is the biggest thing that stuck out to me with this game. It's not even a very good sounding track, but I've said it once and I'll say it again. E flat minor, it is the best chord. God, this track pumps me up so much, I forget it's playing over a whole ass credit sequence, which is largely ignorable anyway, except for this close up of Frankie. <laughs> Speaking of Hurt. So yeah, as you can imagine, my young mind was very entranced with this intro alone. And then I would actually try to play the game, get bored within 5 minutes, and shut it off. I got the dopamine rush I needed, now it's time to play anything else. Probably DKC2, it was another favorite of mine. However, now that I am contractually obligated with myself to give a thorough TED talk about Frank Thomas's Big Hurt Baseball, we may as well start with the most obvious question. Who the hell is Frank Thomas? Well, get ready for some baseball jargon, folks, because according to his Hall of Fame plaque, this fella was one of the MLB's most powerful and consistent hitters, being the only player to have a .300 batting average with at least 20 home runs, 100 RBIs, 100 runs, and 100 walks for seven seasons straight. This allotted him five All-Star Game appearances, four Silver Slugger awards, and back-to-back -back American League MVP titles. So yeah, he's a bit of a legend, and it was after those two specific accomplishments that Acclaim and Iguana Entertainment, hot off the success for NFL Quarterback Club and the home ports for NBA Jam, approached him to be the star player for their crack at a baseball title on 16 and 32-bit systems. As for what this one would bring to the pile of baseball games out by then, Thomas, Iguanas, and Acclaim us wanted to emphasize how real Big Hurt Baseball was to the masses, so as any generic bedroom game reviewer would likely do, let's use this as a template for the game's actual quality and see if this depiction of America's favorite pastime, right after football, golf, basketball, horse racing, golf, shuffleboard, professional fishing, golf too, or to put it in a cheesier fashion, let's see if Big Hurt Baseball is just like real baseball or just hurts. <coughs> so we have a variety of options to choose from once we finally get to the main menu. So let's dive into that exhibition mode and get a decent summation of the mechanics for this realistic baseball sim, as well as gauge what it will be like to play a number of them during the season or playoff mode. The team selection here has us choosing from the standard list of MLB cities. I'll explain why it's like that later, but of course, I had to pick my hometown heroes, Detroit. I mean, since- And sure, let's put them up against those racists in Cleveland and set the show down in ye old Pittsburgh. From there, you have some additional options available that you can use to adjust your teams before the game starts. Namely, shifting their positions in the field, inward, outward, left, right, crisscross, as well as changing the batting lineup and the subsequent position they'll be playing as in the outfield just like real baseball. There's also the pitcher's bullpen, which does look like it will be the more complicated affair that Adler implied it would be. But before we get to how those will affect the actual baseball gameplay, let's get into an actual baseball game. Right off the bat, <laughs> I will say, from a visual standpoint, this is an impressive looking game, especially those animations. According to the scant development notes I could find about it, these are the result of several days worth of motion capture from the game's star player. And some other people, I presume. I mean, it's not exactly groundbreaking for the system itself, but apparently this was one of the first baseball games in general to make the jump to 3D, or pseudo 3D. So credit where credit is due, I suppose. Nifty as they may be on the surface though, like with the player adjustment options, all that really matters is how they work with the baseball gameplay. Cause if that ain't good, then this shit ain't worth jack. Or should I say, cracker jack. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. Let's kick off our dig into this nine inning fiasco with the defensive mechanics, where, big surprise, 
Pitching is the most in-depth feature the game has to offer. You do have the option to throw eight types of pitches and you're able to adjust where the pitch will land as well as determine its speed and height. All through a series of menu options. The combinations here are pretty extensive and there are unique animations to each pitch as well. In addition, the pitchers do grow more and more tired with each pitch and that will eventually start affecting their performance. This can't be mitigated though with the aforementioned bullpen option, where not only can you replace those worn out pitchers outright, but warm up those replacements to keep that pitch speed and performance as high as possible. Just like real baseball. It's not a perfect system. I much prefer just to simply be able to yeet the ball as quickly as possible rather than use this kind of interface, and the AI still managed to snag two homers off my dumbass during the exhibition game, but I will certainly commend them for trying something different here. As for the fielding aspects, those are much simpler. After a hit occurs, the game itself takes control of the player best fit to retrieve the ball and goes from there. Oh, you can control it yourself, but then you risk nudging the player in the wrong direction just as the ball reaches its spot, so you miss it. As such, I just let the CPU do its thing, and all in all, it's a pretty reliable system. No matter what though, you do get controlled back after a player grabs the ball, even if the play is dead, but throwing to bases is a simple matter, and these dudes can go the distance with that shit. As for the offensive mechanics, batting is also about as simple as it gets. Just a matter of waiting for the ball to reach the plate, timing your swing, and getting strikeouts over and over again with the occasional ground ball. Just like real baseball. I mean, it works fine, but there is a slight issue here in that the viewing angle is, well, not the most ideal way to determine when to swing. You could certainly argue it's a realistic point of view, but it's also a very flat and narrow point of view. Seriously, it's easier to pinpoint that by looking at the ball's shadow rather than the ball itself. And I don't think that's quite how real baseball works. What also doesn't help is the computer has access to all those crazy pitch types too, and they constantly change them up. So it's difficult to get a consistent read on them. Personally, I'd rather not play mind games with an AI, thank you. You do have the ability to check your swing though, just in case it looks like it's going to end up outside the strike zone, but that also kind of messes with the timing. And besides that, and jittering the player around in the batter's box, it doesn't seem like you can influence the power of your hit much anyway. So yeah, batting isn't great here, and base running isn't that much better. I just could not get a handle on the controls for that. The manual explains them away perfectly well, but, um, well, I, I didn't read that until I started making this video, so... Whoopsies. Oh, and I ended up losing anyway. Just like real baseball. So with the mechanics for this excitingly, realistically, baseball-y simulator fully present, and with mixed results, let's see how that stands through an entire season. In the season mode, you have a choice of going through a full 162 game franchise, or a shortened 26 game one. Now, wanting to get the true baseball experience for something so realistic, I went with the shorter season. Because, yeah, if it's not apparent already, the nostalgia I have for this game wore out pretty quickly. And to take the bat out of the bag, so to speak, yeah, these mechanics did not hold up through a season mode. For example, all the complicated pitching functions, a lot of them are pretty useless in the long run, especially the bullpen. I just did not see any reason to replace the pitcher at any point during the games. Sure, the pitches weren't as fast as they could have been, but the CPU will get a hit out of anything. Fielding didn't change a whole lot, so that remained pretty meh as well. Except for the few occasions, the game decided to make the catcher go after a long fly ball, and not much really changed with batting and base running too. However, the mechanics by themselves were tolerable enough. What really kills it for me was the pacing for each game, because it is slow. It takes too long for pitches to be thrown, too long for them to be thrown back, too long to transition from batting to fielding after a hit, too long for transitions to happen in general, and too long for any of the animations to finish their cycle, especially with throws. I mean, I could cancel out of them any time I wanted, but the CPU didn't seem to pick up on that. Just like real baseball. And therein lies the true issue with Big Hurt. The focus towards maintaining such a realistic look and feel just led to a very dull experience. 
And honestly, the 16-bit era consoles of the time just did not have the capability to realize the devs' ambitions, which becomes even more apparent when you start noticing how many corners they were cutting. For as neat as these batter sprites are, it's a shame there are only two kinds that don't have any distinct qualities besides one being a bit bigger and lankier than the other. Same thing goes for the pitching, because since every pitcher has access to all eight pitch types, outside of a few changes in the animation from time to time, there's no distinction between those guys either. I bet you could place Frank Hurt himself on the pitching mound and it wouldn't make any difference. Now, I will admit, they didn't skimp out on every aspect. The stadiums, for example, those are all unique. But really, a slight change in how the stadium looks from game to game is far from enough to help with the tedium. Also, while I don't expect any of you to have picked up on this, for a game so hell-bent on being as realistic and accurate to the game of baseball as possible, there are quite a few inconsistencies with some of these stadiums and how they compare to the real stadiums. It's not all of them, but enough to raise a few eyebrows, and those aren't the only ones to do so. Circling back to those city names instead of actual team names, Turns out that they didn't actually get the full MLB license, just the MLB Players Association license. So while they do have the Mr. Frank Thomas and technically all the other players from the 1995 season roster, none of the actual team names could be used. Probably why they allowed you to change any of them to whatever name you'd like. Yeah, I know it ain't cheap to get those kinds of licenses, but with all the production they put into this game, it's pretty galling for the devs to flaunt its realism when they couldn't even go the full mile. What held up the most through repeat play was the sound design. There's no actual music in the game besides the occasional organ riff, but everything else from the crowd sounds to the back cracks to the quick sound bites, it's nicely done. Stay right. There's a soothing quality to it that, once again, I found so entrancing as a kid, and I still admire to this day. Sadly, it was not nearly enough to save the season mode from being a repetitive slog. One that I couldn't even finish properly, too. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention how glitchy this game is? Just like real baseball. It was mostly the game not knowing how to keep stats, as well as some fun graphical fuck-ups. Oh damn, look how long that homer was. Resetting it was usually enough to clear out those issues, but that wouldn't work for the mother of all glitches here. Look at this, I made it to the second to last game of the season, I go into it, I get halfway through the game, and then it crashes on me. I then load the game back up, try again, get halfway through once more, and it still crashes. 17 hours I spent getting to this point, and I'm this close to finishing it up, but I can't bypass this glitch. If this happens with the standard season 2, you would only get just under 15% of the way through before pfft. I don't doubt this could be due to it being a bad ROM, and if I played it on an actual cartridge, it would have worked just fine, but I couldn't find any footage replicating any of these glitches because I think I'm the first person to actually attempt a season playthrough of this thing in about 50 years, so we'll probably never know, because I ain't gonna be the one to do it. <laughs> Considering that, I'm going to heartily blame the game itself and some misbegotten memory management. Sure, I didn't get to the World Series, but that's a separate mode anyway, so I'll just copy the standings that were there and place them in their respective... Oh, that's nice, you can only choose one conference and one team from each division. And then the game selects the rest. Just like real big. Um, anywho, playoff mode isn't really much different than season mode besides the tournament structure. Just another series of games to go through. Too many of them going into extra innings because I still couldn't get into any kind of scoring groove with this thing. And after all that, if you win the big World Series title, you get a few lines of text that may as well just say congratulations, after which it boots you back to the main menu. Well, there's another 12 and a half hours I could have been spending on eating all the Skyline chili in the world. So with the second underwhelming conclusion out of the way, there's still a few more modes to check out. First one being the highly promoted Home Run Derby. Pick five players, pick a stadium, and then spend five minutes hitting some homers before you realize that this is even duller than playing an actual game. After that, I just rushed my way through my five rounds, after which the CPU took over and I immediately clocked out to run some errands while it handily kicked my ass. Whoopee. Funny thing is though, this mode actually has a proper windscreen. 
why this wasn't used for the playoffs mode and instead some stupid home run derby contest was likely up to Mr. Hurt and his big balls. Then again, at least both modes have a windscreen of some sort, unlike the last mode on our hands here. This one was the one I was actually most interested in out of all the modes. You get put into 16 different scenarios and have to meet the required goals, or lose in shame and never pick up another bat for as long as you live. I would like to think there weren't any other baseball games prior to this that had something of a challenge mode, but I'm likely wrong, so I'm not going to commit to that. And even then, despite the intrigue, I still found this mode rather unfulfilling. Some of the premises were pretty cool. Two of them involved maintaining no-hitters, and another saw a recreation of the infamous 1986 World Series Game 6. As if you're trying to change the future and not let the Red Sox horribly fuck things up royally again. Just like real baseball! <coughs> Um, yeah, other than that, though, the rest of it, really all of it, boils down to win the game, don't tie, and you don't get extra innings. And while it was a bit more fun than just playing through a never-ending series of games, as I previously hinted at, you don't get anything out of completing all the scenarios besides this gold checkmark. Thanks? Oh, actually, hold the phone, you do get something upon completion. The Hidden Championship Game Mode. But I didn't bother to check, because by the time I was done with Clutch Mode, I was done with the game entirely. The only thing I wanted to do was just be able to take a few swings at the pitcher's face. And that is pretty much all Mr. Thomas and his big penis has to offer. I mean, yeah, I mean, although I can't exactly end off here without mentioning the other versions of the game on other systems. I toyed with the idea of playing those too but I really only have nostalgia for the SNES one. So let's see if that's a good excuse to continue half-assing this shit. First up, there would be the Sega Genesis version, which looks a lot brighter and even seems like it plays a bit faster than the SNES version does, so that's promising, I suppose. Apparently, this is one of the few 32 meg cartridges that ran on the Genesis, alongside other games like Mortal Kombat 3, Sonic 3D Blast, Toy Story, I presume just any other game on the system that used pre-rendered sprites, Pocahontas is there for some reason, what does that look like? Oh, never mind. However, the sound design is... Uh, very Genesis. And sorry to those who prefer this type of sound for some godforsaken reason, but the only thing hurting in this regard are my ears. Still, if it does actually play more smoothly than the SNES one, it might be worth playing at uh, some point in the future. Unlike the Game Boy version, which, to put it bluntly, is... Dire. Man, if this is how it ended up, I can't imagine the Game Gear version looking much better. Well, yeah, not really, but at least the graphics aren't a total mess. After that, we finally have the 32-bit versions. First the one on PC, then on PlayStation, and finally on Saturn. These were the ones that were actually able to fully realize Mr. Hurt and Iguana's ambitions. They have a more dynamic presentation, full 3D environments, and sound by commentary from Mr. Boom Shakalaka himself, Tim Kitzrow. Strike! The count is no balls, one strike, one out with one on. A towering blast to center field! It's out of here! He is on fire! Okay, that's a little bit annoying, but still admirable. From the scraps of info I could find around the internet, though, pretty much all versions of the game received a dismissive response from critics. But since I only looked at the SNES version, the only opinion that matters here is Nintendo Powers, and their reviewer seemed to be a bit more enthused with it. The only major flaw in their eyes was what they called unrealistically fast base running. And there is some credence to that, because it's impossible to get a double play here unless you're right next to the base runner when you pick up the ball. Oh, wait, sorry, I said I was done with it. Let me just delete that audio. Wait, what's this doing here? Gimme chili. Uh, g g getting back on track, I couldn't find sales figures for those 16-bit versions either, but it seemed like the 32-bit ones did decently well. 
Enough for Mr. Thomas and crew to take another crack at this in the following year with All-Star Baseball 97, featuring Frank Thomas. Yep, surprise, this was the first game of that series all along, and with the second... Well, it's really no different from the previous versions, gameplay-wise, but hey, now they have actual teams and an actual sportscaster doing the commentary. No, it is just like real baseball. And this one did surprisingly well too, so Acclaim just kept churning out new entries in the All-Star Baseball series for almost 10 years straight. It stuck with Nintendo consoles for a while, those ones apparently being some of the best baseball titles on the N64, then they got Sony back into the fray with the PS2, while also letting one of its entries be a launch title for the GameCube, and then they got the Xbox in on the action the following year before it fizzled out entirely by 2004 when Acclaim went bankrupt in the most hilarious downfall of any game publisher up to that point. Oh, and to any of the regular viewers, I'll answer this now. Yes, that will probably end up on controversy. Someday. I guess to sum up this video, um, well, considering this was mostly done to satisfy my own selfish needs and internal longing to return to my youth so I don't have to deal with the troubles of adulthood, I'm not gonna say if I recommend y'alls out there play Frank Thomas's Big Hurt Baseball. I doubt it's gonna see a re-release anytime soon as well, unless its current owners at Liquid Media Group do something with it for some reason. Meanwhile, I can say that despite my fondness for the game, this whole endeavor ended up being an exercise in tedium. One I spent hours upon hours upon hours going through. If I'm gonna do that, I should just stick to long-form visual novels to drive up traffic here and fulfill my own creative needs. <laughs> yeah, that's never gonna happen again. Maybe. I'm just gonna slot this thing back into the comfortable pocket of nostalgic memories which I will surely rediscover again down the line. Sometimes memories should remain as memories, and sometimes the games you play in your youth are complete garbage and you should be ashamed for having liked them in the first place. Okay, I think that's a good enough takeaway for the kiddies to enjoy. Oh, you know, there is another baseball game I was enamored with in my youth. Something a little more substantive, too. And I highly doubt you will be able to guess what this is either, so... Stay tuned for that, I suppose. In the meantime, let's go get some chili. Hi, welcome to Skyline. What can I get for you? Gimme chili. I'm sorry, it's really hard to hear you. What did you say? What's a woman? What's a what's a what's a woman?